Hi, this is Sean. I hope you've been enjoying the Shades Cahaba Oral History Project podcast. I've had a great time meeting new people and producing the show, but now I need something from you. If you like the show, I want you to reach out to one person and tell them about it and encourage them to listen. If you love the show, ask more people to listen. I could spend all the money in the world advertising the show, but it won't help me any more than having a friend recommend it. That's it. That's all I need. Now let's get started with the latest episode. Michael Gross. I became a teacher at Homewood Junior High. I taught um, 7th, 8th, and ninth grade science and history. Married to my college sweetheart, Marilyn. And we married right after graduation. I have two daughters, Jennifer and my other daughter is Elizabeth. Welcome to a special edition of the Shades Cahaba Oral History Project. I'm your host, Sean Wright. Now we've talked a lot about the beginnings of Shades Cahaba High School and the beginnings of Shades Valley High School. But now I want to talk more about the beginnings of other schools in Homewood and the beginning of the Homewood School System. The Board of Education was established on December 22, 1969, but they assumed authority on July 1, 1970, making 2020 the 50th anniversary of the Homewood School System. Now, a lot went into establishing the school system, including working out ownership of schools with the Jefferson County Board of Education, distributing students among the schools and having the high school students attend Shades Valley High School and Homewood Junior High while a new high school was being built. The man who is at the center of this change and a major influence on the school system we have today is my guest, former principal and superintendent Michael Gross. Now, I noticed a similarity between the beginnings of Shades Cahaba High School and Homewood High School during my interview. It's the community gathering around and making the sacrifices needed to create the best school they could have for their children in Homewood. Mr. Gross and I talked for a long time, so I have broken his interview into two episodes. This first one, which is still pretty long, focuses on creating the school system and building the high school. The second is a shorter one that talks about creating a successful athletic program. I may even have a third one depending on how my story develops. But enough of that, let's get on with the show. I've got a lot to talk to you about, so I'm going to start with the thing that's near and dear to my heart with this project is Shades Cahaba. Well, Shades Cahaba is a unique school. It's the first high school over the mountain, and I had pictures of even a dirt road coming from downtown Birmingham up the mountain, and that's how they got their groceries every day, their fresh groceries. Later became an elementary school when Shays Valley was built, and not a lot of remodeling when I was there. The biggest remodeling part was, of course, the normal painting and, and updating of the heater and air conditioning, but the big remodeling was the library. They rebuilt a whole new library. The school was well built, the old floors in there and everything, old wooden floors, but when we tore down that old library, and went above the attic there, we found some things that were really historical. We found the original football helmets of the high school, which were the old leather helmets. We found newspaper clippings of Joe Lewis in his boxing matches, uh, some of the early World Series pictures in the 1920s and 1930s, and old books and things like that. We turned those over to Shays Cahaba. I don't know if they still have them or not. Now, the picture of the buggies coming up the mountain, we left at the Board of Education office. I think they still are there. I hope they're still there. Not a lot of remodeling, just kind of keeping up to date until the, after I left, the major remodeling went in. It was always a fine school, a fine academic school, great teachers, parents. It was one of the smaller schools in, in the city, smaller elementary schools as far as enrollment. In fact, they kept the enrollment down in all the elementary schools. And the class sizes were small. And, of course, they all went, everyone in elementary schools went on to the junior high and then from there to Shades Valley until the Homewood took over their school system and then they went on to Homewood High School. One of the things I was telling uh, the principal, John Lowry, about in our first podcast was 
I think there's 540 kids at Shades Cahaba right now, which, right. according to him, is a good size that fits the school well. But when it was a high school, there were well over a thousand students right. in that entire building, which just blows my mind. So this library that you're talking about that they tore out, was it the one that was up on that main hall? So if you come in the, what was the front door back then? And it was to the left. It was that long hallway there. Yes, it was. It was a long hall. They did do some work in the lunchroom, too. I think they remodeled the lunchroom. And they used to serve some of the best lunches because I used to go down there and eat lunch, <laughs> lunchtime. But Louis Levon was the principal there when I, when I took over as superintendent. Edna Snow was at Edgewood. I'm trying to think of the elementary principal at Hall Kent. I, Gene Burgess. So those were the three. Good administration and good teachers. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Homewood starting its own school system. This year is the 50th anniversary. Back in December 1969, the city council established the board. True. The board took authority in June of 1970. So right. this is going to be the 50th anniversary. Well, I'd like to know a little bit about why we did that and kind of leading up to the high school. We would not have been a school system if it wasn't for the citizens and our parents of the city of Homewood. They wanted something better for their kids. They wanted their kids to be in an atmosphere, and the majority of them were probably going to go on to college or prepare them for life. And we were part of the county, and I'm not going to say any derogatory about the county system, but the city millage tax, there was more going in to the county than what we were getting back. And I don't, I don't want to share any examples, mm-hmm. but I will say when I was teaching, we had large teacher-pupil ratio. We had, um, we had buses, and uh, our buses, we didn't have buses for the junior high. We had to overload from Shades Valley. And back in those days, high school students drove the buses. And a lot of the buses were in very good shape, and... And I wasn't too pleased about that, but that's another story. They wanted something for their kids. And it started back in the late 1960s. I was an administrator at Homewood Junior High, and a couple of the parents came to see me that there was a, all the Jefferson County schools had a long PTA, and they went down to the state PTA meeting, and, you know, every school was 100% for PTA. And projects that the state was giving out, the money that the parents were raising wasn't coming back to the schools. And they went to see me. They went to see the mayor. They went to see the city council. Now, that's just one phase. There's other mm, things. Right. And the mayor and Dr. Mamie Foster, she had a lot of insight to things. And she's a wonderful person. Of course, the mayor, he was instrumental in, in, in getting most of this done and and Judge uh, Sam Pointer formed the school system one weekend in the mayor's office in the late 19, about 1969, uh, 68, 69. And when the city council decided we want a school system, they had to find out, does the city of Homewood have enough millage tax to support the schools, plus build a high school? And the answer was at the present time, with the present schools, they could, but they needed to have some additional funds to build a high school and maintain a high school, which they had to. They hired somebody at UAB in the School of Education who dealt with finance and starting of school systems to do the survey and to do to do the study. And he spent a lot of time, and he found that in order for the city of Homewood to exist financially, they need to raise a 10 mil tax. And that would go into building the high school, help maintaining the rest of the school system. And to have this 10 mil tax, the citizens of Homewood had to vote on it. And it passed overwhelmingly. So then you had the, let's make plans for the high school. First of all, they had to get a a superintendent. And they brought a very experienced superintendent in, and he did really a, a wonderful job. His name was Virgil Nutt, came from the Fairfield system. And there was no school system office, so the first office was set up in City Hall. And we had to find out what teachers wanted to stay with Homewood and what could remain with the county. And that was part of the court order. Teachers had their choice. All the elementary 
principals at that time went on to stay with the county. I was the principal of the junior high, and I wanted to stay with Homewood. So they had to hire three elementary principals. In the meantime, Mr. Nunn was the one that I had to interview, you know, such and such for the elementary principals. He had to work with the city as far as the finances, and let's get that high school built. The property came, Frank Sanford leased that property to the mayor for nothing almost. And, of course, that was part of a lake bed, so they had to fill the lake in. And there was a penalty clause for the contractor that we had to have this school built in such and such a time. And Mr. Nunn, he wasn't going to build a second-rate high school. He wanted the best of the best for the kids. And we didn't, the school system didn't have enough money. Now, back then, it was going to be about a $6 million building, and that's a lot of money for back then. But we only had, when I say we, the school system only had about half that amount. So Mr. Nunn, well, before all that was going on, they had to have a school board. And council appointed a school board. So between the school board and Mr. Nunn, they went to the city, and the city said, we will finance the rest of the money to get the kind of high school you want. Had a great school board, had a great council. Everybody was supportive of the school. Everyone was excited. Now we go to the court order. And in the court order, it said we had to pick up a grade each year. So instead of our, we were grades K through 9, so instead of the 10th graders going to Shades Cahaba, we added a grade. Then we added the 11th grade. And then we got to the seniors. See, that when we added a grade, those kids were at the junior high in Homewood, did mm-hmm. not go on to Shades Cahaba. Mm-hmm. So we made or a Shades Valley. A, Shades Valley, right. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had a, you know, a, um, junior high building that may have grades um, 7 through uh, 9, then 7 through 10, then 7 through 11. And our seniors were to come back from Shades Valley. And needless to say, when you're in a high school, your senior year, you can't graduate from there. They were upset. So I had a meeting at the junior high, and Frank Pete was the principal of Shades Valley, and he's very cooperative with us. He, was, he made the kids available, made things available that – information I needed about the kids and everything. So he cooperated very well. So I had a meeting in the junior high gym and for the parents and the kids, the parents weren't upset, but the kids were. And we had no colors. We had no simp. We had no mascots. We had uh, no rules and regulations. We had nothing. And I said to the seniors, I said, okay, you are the seniors and the responsible. I'm going to, I'm going to say I'm with a lot of guidance. Uh, we're going to let the kids that are in the high school age level, grades 9 through 12, vote on what symbol do you want, your colors. And we had a contest in grades 9 through 12, and almost 90% voted Patriots and the colors red, white, and blue. And we let the kids do that. So we got that established so that we can start, say, for example, for the band and design that. That's another story. Design that <laughs> uniform and uh, uniforms and equipment and things like of that nature. And the seniors uh, said, what about rules and regulations? I said, well, you know, I've been reading up and attending meetings on, on high school rules and regulations. The county had a policy where they, parent permission, they had smoking pits. And they, were, they allowed their kids to smoke. And the kid, first thing they asked me, were you allowed? I said, nope, not going to do it. That was big when I was yeah, there. Right. Not that it was happening, but that I think Barry might have had it. All the county schools. Everybody happening. talked about it. It mm-hmm. seemed like that was the big talk. Was why, you know, are we gonna have a smoking area? And- nope, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> I said I taught, I, I preached against smoking, and, and and it goes back to the time that when I was principal. You know, smoking was the thing for kids in the junior high and high school. I had a doctor come and talk to a, an assembly. Because I was very, I, you know, I was very health conscientious for the, for the kids, and um, I never smoked myself. And I had a doctor speak on that, and the kids, you know, you know, here we hear another story. And the doctor started talking about his best friend having cancer, and he had to do surgery on him. And um, his uh, best friend died. He did an autopsy about how his lungs were just full of cancer. So he's up there on the stage, and this is what he looked like, and he had a, had his lung, those lungs, and he threw them out to the students, and they were some of them were screaming and yelling and fainting, and that made the point. Of course, you can't do that today. Um, 
I was very health conscientious. And, of course, marijuana was a thing, too, over in the high school level, which is something that I had to put my foot down on. But I said, no smoking. And the parents bought into it, and the board bought into it. So, but rules and regulations as far we had to elect a uh, student body president, we had to elect class officers, first prom, all that. I got them involved. I learned a lot about that at first prom. But it was a good class. There was a lot of leadership in that senior class, a really good class. And So uh, a group that initially started out not wanting to be a part of it, not wanting to leave what they'd known for the past three years, you basically gave them ownership. Not necessarily ownership, but a lot of allowing them to make suggestions and a lot of their suggestions were good and a lot of them were not good and that's where we i'm not saying me we would try to guide them and say this is the reason why we can't do this and this is the reason why we can do this when we got those seniors back and we were all at the junior high building we didn't have enough room for them so the churches were very helpful, and Dawson, we had the seniors there, and they went back and forth from Dawson to the junior high building, and the eighth graders were at Trinity, and they went back and forth. Most of the eighth graders were able to stay there, and the elementary schools became K through 7 while this was going on, so everything was overcrowded, but that was only supposed to last a semester until the high school was ready to open up. So a lot of our kids were very involved in all activities, debate, math team. We had an Air Force ROTC mm-hmm. unit there, which was very popular and very successful. Still there. Still there. And um, what was interesting, talking to other people and reading, the thing that seems to make Homewood special as far as education goes is Shades Kyle High School was built because people there wanted a better school. They actually did the same thing. I think they had a five mil tax that they raised mm-hmm. to build that school. And that school district was huge. It went all the way from, I think, St. Clair County all the way oh, to right. Bessemer. Mm-hmm. It wasn't quite as deep. It was just nice and long. Mm-hmm. Um, so they spent money there. During the Depression, Homewood, they kept Shades Cahaba open nine months and Edgewood open nine months out of the year. Uh, Hall Kent was shut down. Most of the schools went to a six-month because they didn't have enough money, mm-hmm. but Homewood actually went and found money and spent money. So there's this continuum of support for the school system um, from, from day one, from 1919 when they first started talking about this to, uh, to today. So it, it's interesting that they did that, and they, they, um, they spent the money, and they continue to spend the money now, which I think is probably what led Homewood to be what it is now as it is. So tell me about you being principal. I was the principal of the junior high when the city took over the school system. And the kids knew me, and I, I knew them and the, and the parents. And I was very involved with them as far as activities and projects and trying to do what is the best thing I could to help them out and also make the change, like adding all these grades to the junior high and trying to make it easier on them. And Virgil Nunn was the one that recommended me to the board to be the principal, and I became the principal. And I was um, 32. 32. Mm -hmm. That is awful young, speaking as a (laughs) 56-year-old man. (laughs) 32. Do you think that was, that helped you, or? I don't even, I don't even remember that being a factor. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I worked very hard along with all those teachers and all those parents to get that thing going, and tried to do some things for them that was not being done for them and um, trying to make it easier and safer and really the parents trying to establish uh, a school see the majority of them wanted to go to college and we tried to hire the best teachers which I thought we did to get these kids prepared for college Mm -hmm. but here's the thing when we were at the junior high building in order for the students to graduate from an accredited high school I had to get the junior high accredited by Southern Association as a high school while they were at the junior high. And then when they moved over to the high school, I had to get the high school accredited. So I, we went through that twice, right when we moved, started the junior high. But, and that was, that was a lot of work. And then as soon as we moved into the high school, then we were accredited again. We, we could get state accreditation right. without any problem. But Southern Association is a little more stricter and has some... Uh, I have a story about the Southern Association. Shades Cahaba wanted to be accredited when they opened up. And what held them back was they didn't have a, a strong enough library. What became the PTA, 
took matters into their own hands and basically built their library within six months. And I found an ad or a, a, an article in a paper just recently that talked about, hey, we're looking for books. These are the kind of books we need mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And that was um, that seemed to be a, a pretty big deal. So they were pretty excited about that. On high school accreditation, mm-hmm. you have to have Southern Association 10 books per student. So oh, you wow. can imagine how many we had to purchase. Wow. That is a lot. I guess that seems to be their thing. Um, that's it's holding everybody back are the books. Well, you see, I know there are other things. There were, but, there were no computers, so yeah. the only way to do research and, and to mm-hmm. study and, and for the particular grade uh, subject they were studying, you had to go to the books. Besides the teacher, we started the school system in name in 1970. That's when the Board of Education mm-hmm. started. But I think as a, the schools became Homewood Schools in '71, I'm guessing that mm-hmm. first year. The one thing that's always interested me and I've talked about with alumni on Facebook is that transition period that we're talking about, that you've got your seniors at Dawson, you've got eighth graders at Trinity, you've got people walking back and forth. And by the way, some of them have fessed up and you might not have had a smoking area, but they were smoking between Dawson and, and the oh, junior. There's a, wood, there's a wooded area there. And you, right. And, you know, if I caught them, you know, we had certain, you know, yeah. there, there were rules. But I had bigger problems. I mean, trying to get the high school built and get, yeah. and um, you know, we had uh, rules. Um, you know, I, in particular, our seniors, uh, they wanted a lot of, um, uh, pro- they wanted a lot of things themselves. And I said, if you're responsible people, then you know, it's going to work. Mm-hmm. And in some cases they were. In most cases they were. In some cases, some of them, you know, you're always going to have a few were not. I had a, a story of a student, and this was later on, that when I was principal, he was a smoker. And he just got accepted to a pretty good four-year school. And I caught him at the school, and the mm-hmm. school was smoking. And he said, oh, my goodness, don't. He, t- he told me this story about two years ago, and I couldn't remember. He <laughs> said, please don't suspend me. Please don't. So I had him for the rest of the, this was in the spring, for the rest of the school year, he had to get on, clean the, um, the stairways, mop and mop the oh. stairways. But when I called a smoker, a lot of them put them out in the parking lot cleaning up the trash and tried to keep them in school. But if they mm-hmm. called again, if they weren't responsible, then we had other things for them. Right. <laughs> Help me understand here. So when, when Homewood came together and you had to put the students at the schools, it was because we didn't have a high school True. yet. So help me understand, time. How, many, how long did you have to do that? And my understanding was there was a time where everybody thought that the um, you were going to have another year at Shades Valley, but they had to come back to Homewood. The court order said that. We okay. had to pick up a grade every year. And by that time, the, it was the seniors were to be at Homewood, and the school high school was not ready to open. Okay, okay. So was, that was my understanding. Some people were telling me that they had practiced with the Shades Valley Band or practice with a football team, and then they had to come back to Homewood. No. Are they wrong Well, on the that? spring training, the year before they came, they, they practiced – you know, in the spring hmm. of their junior year, they would practice with the team, and the same thing with the band. Once we started our school year, they were ours, lock, okay. stock, and barrel. They just didn't realize that, no. that they were coming back. Mm-hmm. Okay, they came back. We didn't have a high school. Was the high school supposed to have been built a little earlier because the move-in date was in the middle of the school year? As I said, there was a penalty clause, and uh, I think, th- and I'm, I may be wrong, but I think that the it was supposed to be completed by December of that year. In fact, we had the auditorium and we had our Christmas program. Mm-hmm. The only thing that was open was the auditorium. We invited the whole community there, and it was standing room only. And a very nice auditorium, and they put on a heck of a Christmas show. It's and the same auditorium, by the way. It is, it's, yeah. It's, I, it's, I don't think it's any different from the first time I went in there. And what year would that have been? Set fall of 77? <laughs> We had to make some changes with the stage and some of the logistics as far as operational things back there and lighting and everything. Other than that, it was pretty pretty much the same. We, it was a, really the first semester of their senior year was trying for the whole school system because that's when we were all elementaries were K seven and you know we had eight through twelve. But everybody worked together. I mean, it just they were so enthused about that high school being built. And in fact, in December, when the school was turned over to us, they were dropping off all the desks and, and, and equipment from the school, and I had no way to move it in. Mm-hmm. 
And the seniors were about ready to go into exams, and I said, I'm going to let you make a choice. Do you want me to You want to help me move the furniture in, or you want to take your final exams? And they are 100% of them. <laughs> Not only that, they helped me during the holidays mm-hmm. move it in. And the idea was, and I'm going one step further, the first day of school in January, right after the Christmas holidays, was to have all the kids in the auditorium. And we already had our high school faculty because they were teaching either at uh, Dawson or at the junior high building. But uh, they knew who their homeroom was to take those kids and to the homeroom, go through all that, then take them on a tour of the building because most of them have never been through the building. And seeing all those pods and the and the Patriot Lounge and, and, and the swimming pool, all that was new to them. And one, labs were wonderful. I mean, up-to-date, modern chemistry, physics, and biology labs. That was the idea to do the first day of school. I don't forget, I was running around like a chick with my head cut off. I was so busy. Some of the kids came out and said, Mr. Gross, you got a problem out in that parking lot. <laughs> and they said, you better go out there. And the traffic was backed up to Blakeshore and was backed up down by the armory and there was this van and in the van you're f- familiar with the Moonies? Yes. Okay. They were passing out literature. You know, they had their white clothing on if you call that clothing and I told him, I said, you can't do this. I mean, this is, this is we're the first day of school. We're not leaving. We're not leaving. So I called the Homewood Police, and they came over there with a paddy wagon and started loading them up. And the head guy turned to me. He said, isn't this Sanford University? I said, no, it's across the way. They thought we were Sanford <laughs> University. So that was that was the experience. And then that same year in February, there was a bank robbery in downtown. And the police chased the bank robbers, lo and behold, to the parking lot, Homewood High School. And they had the Birmingham police, they had the state police, they had the county, they had Homewood police, Vestavia police. And they were out there, I heard, I was in the gym, I heard this pinging outside in the parking lot by the gym, and they were having a gun battle out there. (laughs) And so (laughs) we got all our kids, make sure they were all indoors, make sure they were all away from the windows. And the idea, the police chased them up above, you know, the high parking lot, Mm -hmm. and that was all woods behind there, chased them in the woods. But we wanted to get the kids out of the school because when school got out at 3, we were worried that the bank robbers were going to come out of the woods and start kidnapping these, grabbing these kids. So the police lined the road, and we got all the kids out of there. Lo and behold, the bank robbers got away. They got through the woods, and they went up. They never did, they never did catch them. They went straight up to the temple up there, yeah. I guess. So let me ask you about a couple of rumors that we always had. And you can tell me if this is true or not. So the first big rumor was the school was sinking. Well, the reason why they, that's a rumor. The reason why, <laughs> boy, I mean, when they built that thing, you know, their foundation was because the practice field was used to be part of the lake. You know, that was a resort all that whole area was a lake. The, and that's probably where they got that from. But no, the school's, just, the school's not sinking. That rumor went on for years. Oh, the school's <laughs> sinking. Well, it looks pretty fine to me. <laughs> Just a rumor. <laughs> Just a rumor. All right, so the other rumor that we had was <coughs> the, the thing that I, I loved was, uh, and for those who, who have not been to the high school, we had pods. We had four mm-hmm. pods in the four corners, and it was an open area with all the classes opened into that open area. And what was unique about it was there were no doors. And I never heard any of the other classes. I thought it was a really great experience. Mm-hmm. So the rumor was that it was built – with this big open area so that computers could be out there and students could go get their class things and go into the classroom. Was there any reason why we had that big open space in the pods? Well, first of all, we, we didn't have computers back in those days. <laughs> well, we're thinking ahead, right? <laughs> okay. We're futuristic no, at school. <laughs> no, that, that was just the way the architect, it was the modern it was uh, supposed to be something of the future, having them by the grade. That's just the way it occurred. And uh, it was unheard of of having a lounge because we had a couple drink machines in there for them. Right. And see, I didn't have a lot of money to operate the schools. And by having those drink machines, we were able to get money. And then there's another way I raised money, which I don't say to tell a lot about this, but I got away with it. But we did not have money. We needed money for 
classroom supplies. And the, and the school system was stretched. I mean, I mean, they just started a multi-million dollar high school, hired all these teachers. So there's all, only so much money they we could have. Another thing, the state, you were always a year behind before you got your money, the mm-hmm. state, because it was based on average daily attendance. Well, we didn't have average daily attendance because we didn't have a school. So mm-hmm. it, we were strapped. I'm not saying we were poor, but some things that I needed, and I have to tell you about if you want to know about how I got all the athletic equipment, I had a movie for all my, it was It was a spring day, and it was getting close to a holiday, and I charged them a dollar a piece if they wanted to see the movie. And, of course, the money we would use to buy paper and school supplies. Well, the movie was Psycho. Now, I don't know if you remember, in the movie, there's a scene when she's in the shower, and you can assume what she looked like. All right. So when that scene came in, I knew, I said, I better take care of, I don't want to get in trouble. I put my hand in front of the camera. I heard a lot of booing and ooing and aahing, but I wasn't going to have that scene in there. And uh, we also raised money by having a fair when school was ending. It was called Patriot Day. And we let the club set up in the parking lot by the gym set up booze, they, you know, they had a dunking machine, they had this, they had, it was all fun. And the clubs, they had no money, and the clubs, like the math team, science, you know, all of them had their own booth, and it was fun. As long as I was there, we had Patriot Day, and that helped raise money. We tried to do positive things, I guess, other than psycho. <laughs> you did the movie multiple years, because when I was a freshman, and that would have been 77, 78, it was your last year as principal, I remember we had a movie. And so I didn't remember paying, but I'm assuming I paid a dollar. A dollar, and that went to help fund some other things in the right, school. Right. Oh, I, I hope I covered the camera. The camera <laughs> that. I wasn't going to let those students and those teachers, like the debate team, be held back because we didn't have money funds for them mm-hmm. to participate. Same with the mat, same with the Spanish club or anyone. We try and this is one thing about being in the school system. We want to provide things which would help them and help them in their classroom and help them in the future. Of course, a lot of them helped them get in college. And um, we, we did okay. We, we survived. We, we struggled a little. But str- there's nothing wrong with struggling as long as it comes out to something positive. And you were principal for how many years? Uh, seven, well, if you, don't, if you just count the high school, 72 to 78. Okay, and then you became superintendent, superintendent for how long? 78 and 85. 85. And then at 85, you went to Vestavia Vesta as principal. And the reason why I left Homewood, of course, I was there o- over 20 years. Yeah. I liked being superintendent. It was different, but I did not like all the meetings to go to in Montgomery and you get down there. And I miss being with the kids. And right. that's why I got into education, to be with the kids. And I knew the superintendent from Vestavia real well, and they offered me the job. And and how long were you at Best Davy High School? 85 to 99, and then I retired, and they called me back in. I told them I'd stay six months as, as uh, interim superintendent, and I stayed a year and a half. So about 2001 is when I really retired. Let me back up way far. In the 60s, you were at junior high. junior high school. I talked with Herman Maxwell on one of the episodes, and we talked about Homewood integrating. I'd like to kind of hear your side of it. So I know that there was a court order there was a, uh, I have a sheet of paper from Jefferson County that talks about you pick the school that you want to go to, and Herman told us a little bit about it. Tell me what was going on, any issues you had, how the whole experience happened from your point of view. Well, we were, it were, we were the county schools. Hmm. It wasn't, we hadn't started the system right. yet. It was like in 67, 68 maybe that the court order said that there had to be a percentage of students and percentage of teachers. And the school that we were matched up with was Rosedale. And, of course, we didn't have a high school, so we weren't matched up with anyone. The students at Homewood Junior High and the students at Rosedale knew each other, played park ball together, you know, knew each other in the community. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't like stranger meeting stranger. We talked to our kids and our parents, no problems. And the county let me go over and talk to the Rosedale kids, and and we told them what we were going to do. Needless to say that, you know, those were back in the days where you had to buy your own books. Mm -hmm. And it was tough on those kids. And, of course, Dr. Foster was really helping 
at that time, and even after we became assistant, you get help these kids get caught up. Now, not a lot of uh, not a lot of them, but they had to have books, and we had to get books for them. It was very smooth. Uh, they fit right in in all the athletic teams and all the all the uh, uh, band and all the other activities. There just wasn't any problem, any real big problems to speak of. You know, you're going to have problems with anything, whether, sure. but there wasn't really anything significant, and it went really smooth. And that's what really has surprised me through all this is the fact that nobody's really had an issue. I mean, there might have been some individual issues here and there, and, and but, sure. but overall, that it just mm-hmm. it went really smooth. And when you you know you grew up in Birmingham and you know the history and you know what was going on in '67 and '68, it's it's really remarkable that uh, um, the uh, um, integration went over as well as it did. Well, you have a Dr. Mimi Foster, and then you have a Bob Waldrop as the mayor, and you have the other leaders in the council and the school system, you're not going to have those kind of problems. Right. And Dr. Foster, she was, I know she was on the school board. School board. Okay. Do you know anything about her background? She was always around, in my memory, uh, growing up in Homewood. She was as as big a part of Homewood as anybody She's an educator. Around. And yeah. she was at Alabama um, A&M, mm-hmm. was her school in Huntsville. And um, got her degrees from there, got her doctorate. And I can't remember where she got her doctorate from, but she worked for the county. And she was a supervisor in curriculum for the county, especially reading. She grew up in that atmosphere. Now, her mom and dad were one of the first residents of, of Homewood. Mm-hmm. And they owned all that property where the, the old Homewood um, City Hall is in the, in the police station. They owned all that property there. So they were one of the first residents, her parents, of the city of Homewood. And she was just a fine lady, very supportive, very helpful. Uh, we were able to do some things for the Rosedale community by being our own school system that have not been done before. And she was a significant person in getting those things started. And very well liked. She's the only school board member that I know of when I was there that was reappointed each time for a number of years until her health became a concern. And she moved to California where she had family, and I think she passed away out there. So Homewood High School starts. You put a lot of sweat equity into getting that thing off the ground and, and getting it to where it is today. Anything? Would you have done anything different? Oh, you're always going to do something different. Um, I, I, I don't I, – that's a hard question to answer. Um, you, you, you're always going to find something different, mm-hmm. maybe how you handle the student or how sure. you – or what – what you're going to do in this situation or that situation. Um, uh, and I'll tell you a story about, uh, I was pretty strict, I guess. Um, and I, I didn't, I didn't like certain things, you know, when I'm smoking, cutting school, use of marijuana or what have you. But I went to one of the early reunions of the Homewood high school class. I guess it was, might've been the, the second class that graduated or, and um, this st- former, st- there's still kids to me. She introduced me to her husband, and she was a professor at a university, and her husband was a professor at a university. She said, well, Mr. Gross, I've had nightmares from you all along, <laughs> all these years. I said, what happened? She said, when I was a junior, I cut school, and I was missing. And you got my parents, and you went looking for me, and you found me. There was no Brooklyn Mall at that time. I don't know where she was. She may have been downtown shopping. And she said, you suspended me, scared me to death, and I'm still scared. <laughs> I said, well, let me, let me tell you something. After all these years, I'm going to pardon you. <laughs> so I told that class, I said, how many of you were suspended? And very few of them with their hands yeah. when I was talking to them. I said, well, you all are pardoned now. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that you, you say that you were strict. Uh, not only had you for one year. But I didn't find you strict. Maybe because I wasn't getting. You I never got in trouble. <laughs> I was never coming to your office. That was that was it. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I I thought it was a great experience. I um, speaking of strict, I, I'd like to get your opinion on this because this is something that uh, just kind of hit me today. What was your feeling about corporal punishment paddling? That was a big deal. Well, it's a state law. You can still you can still have it. You can. Yes, but I, you better not use it. I never thought. Now. <laughs> In the junior high, I'm left-handed, so the kids built me a left-handed paddle. <laughs> and I'd go up to a kid, and I, you know, like yeah. that. But high school students, you don't want to paddle. 
Yeah. There's always something else. Picking up paper and other time, not driving, being able to drive mm-hmm. early school or after school detention. But I didn't believe in paddling high school kids. I didn't paddle it. Um, I, I always thought it was such an odd thing. I was paddled twice in middle school. At one time. You were. Yeah. Paddled by the choir teacher. Well, I never let teachers paddle. Yeah. Well, I, I got paddled by the choir teacher. And then I got paddled by one of the coaches, PE coaches, because I happened to be in the middle of two kids who were talking. <laughs> so one time I might have been, should have been, and the other time. And, and it's just always been... That thing, I think the uh, the threat of the paddle was was greater than the paddle. I, that, when they saw my left handed paddle, they knew that we, <laughs> I, they rather they rather go pick up paper. And uh, we had a reunion of the classes of the late '60s and early '70s several years ago at one of the big hotels out in uh, out on 280. I was getting ready to leave. I told the kids, I said, "They're still kids, and I'm in their '60s." I said, "The principal is now leaving, so the bar is open." <laughs> But I went out there in the parking lot. My wife and I were getting ready to get in the car, and this youngster, he's probably in the 60s, came up to me. He said, you know, Mr. Gross, I was a smoker, and you made me go out and pick up the trash. I was out there almost every day for a year mm-hmm. picking up trash. And he said, you know, I never did break me up smoking. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I look back, and, and I have good memories, both mm-hmm. school systems, because there were two very fine school right. systems, two systems where the parents were interested and their kids are getting a quality education. And, you know, there are things that are going to happen to keep you busy. There, there are moments that make your hair go gray. But all in all, I was very fortunate, very fortunate. I consider myself to be lucky. And I had close to 40 years in education. Faculties were wonderful. Overall went over and beyond. You know, you think teachers leave at 3 o'clock. They don't leave at 3 o'clock. A lot of them were there when I was turning the lights out at 6 o'clock. Mm-hmm. They'd come up on weekends and holidays and work both school systems. You hire, the key is you hire dedicated teachers. And one of my biggest jobs was to make sure that they could teach with a free atmosphere of being able to educate without having problems, whether it be discipline or having the right equipment or so-and-so. It's not a utopia, but it was pretty close. I've kind of hit all my things. You got any other good Homewood stories for me? (laughs) I probably have a lot, and probably some I can't tell you about. Uh, I'm smiling because some of the things can't. You know, when the high school was built, and we were back there, and there wasn't much back in that area, I had somewhat of a problem of adults from out of town that have RVs meeting in our parking lot and spend the weekend. <laughs> and I had to deal with that. Now, why were they there? Well, they want to get a motel room. Just because it was out of the way, it was... They weren't married to each other. Okay. And they had been married to somebody else. And they weren't from Birmingham area, but they were always headed up on a weekend in my parking lot or our <laughs> parking lot. And I told them that this was not a motel. Those are some of the things that... That, that must have been on a list somewhere. People, oh yeah, Homewood. It was a remote area. Yeah. And uh, I... Uh, it was really remote back then because yeah. you didn't have that bridge that crossed over to Sanford now. No. You had to go all the way down to Columbiana. Well, there wasn't a lot on each yeah. side of South Lake Shore. Mm-hmm. All right. I do have two more things I was mm-hmm. going to ask you about. So what was the reasoning for a pool? Why did we have a pool at Homewood High School? <sighs> that was the superintendent and board's members' problem. And they wanted everyone that graduated from... Homewood High School, to have uh, water safety. And it didn't work out. I, I did have my first swimming coach, and he was he would come after school. Butch Brash, in the, and he was the older Brash. I had him in junior high, and great, great person. And he probably had three, 400 people on the swimming team. <laughs> but there weren't a lot of swimming teams back then. Right. And um, it just wasn't used a lot. I think I got in the pool a couple of times we did it a few times in pe it was such a pain to they get they wet filled and, it in um yeah. i was only in that pool one time the, the night we won the state championship they threw me in <laughs> and i was i was okay there was an accident that we we let these swim teams use it mm-hmm. and there was one youngster that took a bad fall and he ended up being okay but they had uh, scuba diving was taught there at night mm-hmm and other other things but it just just wasn't used expensive mm-hmm. just think about how you empty that pool and you have to fill it up with water and um the county checked it all the time with the right chlorine and everything so it was really hard to keep up 
it was a fun extravagance. It was fun to <coughs> tell people we had it. But, you know, mm-hmm. again, I, I was only in it a few times and I wasn't on the swim team. And that's one of those things I tell my wife now when you go in that – that building is now the ninth grade hall. Yeah. <laughs> and you say, I tell my son, okay, this is chemistry, but this is where the pool was. And you hall. know, the parents we had that came from out of state, the home order of Davy, they were amazed of the school system. And let's talk about home order. They were amazed at the, the facilities they had and the teachers they had. They didn't have them in, in their areas. And they, mm-hmm. these were you know, professional people coming from um, Minnesota or New York or, or California, wherever. We were very fortunate to have uh, the Homewood and West Davis school system, mm-hmm. of course, dealing with Homewood. And um, I, I think these, these Homewood folks, they're, they're very caring. It's a very caring group, all of them. Okay, the one thing that we did not talk about, I can't believe I almost walked out of here without doing it, is the, the Homewood Patriot Marching Band, which is near and dear to my heart. My son's in the band. My brother was in the band. Fortunately, I was not. But uh, um, how'd that get started well, here again with the Patriots, the design, uh, Cindy Wade, the Star Spangled Girls, and some others designed the uh, theme was, you know, the old Patriot. Mm-hmm. It cost more to put a student in a, in a band uniform than it did a football uniform. <laughs> and it grew and grew. And finally, when Pat Morrow took over, it really grew. I mean, he, he took it to, I told Pat, the last few years, I said, you've been everywhere. The next thing I know, you're going to be the first band to play on the moon. And first Macy's Day Parade was Pat Morrow, 78. Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget, this is the first time these kids ever made a trip like that. And the first time a lot of them have ever been to New York. Yeah. And we told the kids, and I'll never forget, telling them that whatever that band director does, you're going to do. You follow everything he does. So when they get into New York a day or two before Macy's, it was snowing. It's the first time a lot of them saw snow. The first time a lot of them been on a plane. But, hey, Pat had everything organized. And that night they were to go to Radio City Music Hall to see the Rockettes and to see a movie. First the Rockettes perform. Pat gets up to walk out of there to go get a popcorn and Coke, and 250 kids get up and walk out and follow them. <laughs> Uh, we had no problems on those trips. Uh, they were just great. Parents went as chaperones with other teachers, and he was able to travel with the band because they were not only did they perform well, but they uh, they were first class. That was a big deal in the community mm-hmm. when, when that happened. Uh, I think that was my sophomore year. You know, seeing them all go, and I was quite jealous of them going. And who would have thought that we'd be We'd have gone many more times. Um, we were there just last year watching them yeah. perform again. And probably the only band that went by that did not have a feather in its hat. We have the very unique uniforms. Yeah. And, but are there more in the, in the Homeward Patriot Band than there are in some colleges? Yeah, the What I heard was last year, when because everybody wanted to be in the band last year, they had 420 kids they took to uh, Macy's, which I believe is larger than any other band in Alabama, including are the colleges, sixty six in the drum corps alone, mm-hmm. and uh, but and, and what's remarkable is Homewood, even though it's a big school, it's not big like you know Hoover or some of these other places. And it's amazing that you have you know almost half the you know somewhere between a third and a half of the students are in the band. It's become a tradition. Mm-hmm. But Pat Morrow was a key person to get all that school, and Cindy Wade. Cindy was um, the Star Spangled Girls and. And she had a great group, and uh, and both of them worked real well together. And I'm trying to think who the other assistants are, and I can't remember. Daryl Ursery was. Daryl Ursery. Mm-hmm. Daryl Ursery had the flag corps, mm-hmm. and he's another one. And so if I forgot anybody when I'm in this interview, <laughs> it's because of old age. It's not right. because <laughs> uh, I, don't, I didn't mean to leave him out. But Pat Morrill was something else. Still, I mean, when I say something, it's, it's present tense. He's still around. Yeah, it's it's been – Fun watching them. I hear um, the band director is going to retire. The one that has yes, that. he retired, and Chris Cooper's taking over. Who's who, Chris Cooper? He was, or I guess is, he was the director at the middle school for okay. years. Okay. But the, the thing about the band directors is they're all working together from the middle school to the high school. That's important. And uh, it's, it's, it's a seamless transition. Mm-hmm. And, it's a key. Um, and That's I, important. I've gotten to know him over the years just because, mm-hmm. you know, my son's followed him mm-hmm. all the way through. But uh, 
is not going to miss a beat and mm-hmm. it'll be interesting to see what he brings to it and, and adds to it. So um, this past year, it's so much fun to go to the football games and, and hear the band. And back when I was in high school, our football team wasn't that good. And we would go see, see the band and it was, it was great. All my stories, no matter who I talk to, whether it's um, superintendents, principals, whatever, it all comes back to community. Not that Homewood is unique or special or anything as opposed to other communities, but it's the community coming together that really makes That's our true. story That's very true. special. And um, it, it doesn't make any difference what color you are, mm-hmm. what nationality you are, what religion you are. They're all together. Yeah. And it, it's um, it's a to me it's a unique situation. It really is. Mm-hmm. Well, I appreciate you taking. Well, I'm, I'm time hope I helped out. I probably talk too much. No, uh, you can never talk too uh, much. Uh, but uh, I, I know people are going to be thrilled <coughs> to hear this. You're a, a big topic on Facebook, <laughs> at least among the old guys from the uh, high school. Oh, yeah. So, uh, um, thanks for, for your well, time. And if I can help in anything. Thanks again to Michael Gross for talking to us about the beginnings of the Homewood School System. But be sure to listen to part two, where we talk about athletics during the early years at Homewood High School. It's a much shorter episode, but I think you'll enjoy it. See you next time on the Shades Cahaba Oral History Project.